Hello everybody, happy Monday of the first week after half term. Hope you all had a good break. Hope most of you are now more or less um, up to date with where you need to be. I have been supporting a number of you in a few shortcuts uh, to make sure that we're all starting um, today uh, in the same place. Okay, so before half term, uh, Mr. Stevenson's voice was filling your ears with his dulcet tones and talking you through the balcony scene. The balcony scene is a, a really famous scene uh, in literature. You can see I've included a little image there. Um, in ordinary times, we may well have tried to organise a theatre trip for us to go and see a production of Romeo and Juliet. After all, it is a play. It is meant to be seen, it is meant to be experienced um, in that uh, four dimensional uh, world, not just as words on a piece of paper. However, of course, that is not available to us. And so we are, are doing our best here. I put that image in because it's a really good image to highlight the distance that exists between Romeo and Juliet. And this is a distance that we really need to be aware of. So uh, physically on the stage here, Shakespeare shows the huge gap, the huge divide, the huge void that Romeo and Juliet need to overcome just to be together. But of course, that's not only a literal divide in the fact that um, neither of their families would want them to be together but it is a metaphorical divide as well because as an audience and as a reader we know that even if they do get together they're not going to stay together so whatever they say and whatever they do they will not be allowed to live their lives out to an old age being married to each other it just it's just not going to happen folks and I think this balcony scene for me uh, as a visual representation of that distance works really well. Shakespeare absolutely created that uh, gap, that distance between them in this scene to show just just that. That they are they are not going to be spending the rest of their lives together. They're going to be dead before the play uh, is over. OK, so I'm going to stop waffling now, but I, I, I really like students writing about that idea and that concept in essays. It's something a bit unusual. Not everybody teaches it or focuses students on that. And it can be a really nice way to write about either Romeo or an essay on Juliet or an essay on love or an essay on conflict. OK, so that idea is a really useful idea in a number of essays. OK, so a quick recap, because obviously it is uh, nearly two weeks since you um, were doing the balcony scene. So uh, I'll just read through my 11 quick events. So Romeo enters the Capulet Garden facing death. If he is caught, he is trespassing. Remember Tybalt wanted to kill him on the spot because he'd arrived at the party. So, um, you know, it would be a double insult as far as Tybalt were concerned if he were to be found in the garden that evening as well. Romeo compares Juliet to the sun. So it's like she has become his life force. She's very bright. Um, she's very warming. She is the thing that allows him to live. Juliet speaks of her love for Romeo, not knowing he is listening. Remember, she doesn't know he's there at the beginning. Romeo then announces himself and they talk of love. Juliet is worried about the danger Romeo is in whilst in her garden. Romeo says he would he would rather death than be without her. Juliet is worried Romeo will judge her for being so quick to say she loves him. It's not really how a, a young lady should have behaved uh, in those days. They agree to marry. 
Romeo and the nurse will meet at nine to discuss the arrangements for this wedding. Juliet goes back inside and Romeo heads off to find help. But at the minute, we're not quite sure where he's going for that help. And then just to finish off this memory jog for you, key quotes from uh, the balcony scene. It is the east and Juliet is the sun. I've got a metaphor there that I've already uh, referred to <clears throat> in number two of the of the events box. Oh, speak again, bright angel. So we've got the reinforcing there by Shakespeare of how how close, how imminent um, Juliet's death is. Deny thy father and refuse thy name. So they can only really be together properly um, if they pretend that they're not enemies and they're not foes. That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. So what does a name really mean? We can, we can take a name away. You know, I could, be, I could come back um, on the 8th of March if that's when we return to school and I could have changed my name and um, be Mrs English. Would that make me any different? Not really. I'd still be the same person. I'd still sing to my class. I'd still rabbit on about galaxy chocolate bars and all the other things that I do. I would still be the same. I would just have a different type. Thinkest I am too quickly won, as well as too sudden, too light lightning. So that's Juliet worried about how quickly this is all happening and whether that's a good thing. And then finally, parting is such sweet sorrow. And we have that lovely uh, oxymoron there, sweet sorrow, because sorrow isn't normally sweet. But here it is, because the sooner they part, the sooner they'll meet up and get married. OK, so they are key quotes. If you want to spend some time um, writing down those key events of the balcony scene or writing down those key quotes, you can. But of course, you've got all your work that you did uh, in that last week. So it's more of a quick memory prompt at the beginning of this lesson that those are the things that we were looking at the last time we studied Romeo and Juliet. OK, move on to the next slide and we are going to meet a new character. <laughs> Great, I would like you to put today's date and the title, who is Friar Lawrence? Um, underline both, pause me whilst you do so, and then come back. Okay, Friar Lawrence is a very important character um, plot wise. He makes a number of decisions through the course of the play which have uh, a key effect upon how the play uh, pans out. He's a, he's a catalyst for a number of events happening. Um, I want you to write down these six imp uh, important points about him when I've read through them. When, I write, what, when you write them down, I just want you to write down the six points. I don't want you to try and write down everything that I say. OK, those of you who seem to write down every and if button maybe that comes out of my mouth from Mr. Stevenson's mouth, you don't need to do it. OK, just listen and then copy those six comments down and then we'll move on. So, um, number one, Friar Lawrence is a religious man. And at the time, religious people were very respected for learning and for their position. His role was to guide the people of Verona in their religious um, beliefs and their religious practices. They would go to him for confession. So he, he really was very trusted um, because he was seen sort of as the vehicle, as the mouthpiece for God in Verona. Uh, so in terms of position in society, although he's not very wealthy, he is up there just below uh, the prince um, because of the important spiritual role that he has. Uh, he would have been known 
uh, or he will have known Romeo and Juliet all their lives. So before the play begins, he already has a close relationship and affection for both of them, which has been created uh, over the years of them, um, again, trusting him and seeing him as their confessor. He will have been trusted by the Capula and Montague families and Romeo and Juliet would have both been allowed to visit him without any questioning at all. Juliet will have needed um, a chaperone with her. Remember, she wasn't allowed as a young woman to go out on her own, but Romeo would not have needed that because young men had so much more freedom. He's Romeo's friend. Now, this is really important. He knows about Romeo's feelings for Rosaline when nobody else does. Not even his parents, remember, knew what was wrong with Romeo, what was making him so miserable and fed up. And they had to ask Benvolio to go and find out. So the fact that the friar knows about Rosaline uh, shows um, how trusted he is. Uh, by Romeo. And it's this uh, trust and this time that he spends with the friar, which means that the friar is more of a father figure to Romeo than Lord Montague. We never actually see Romeo and his father together in the play. Um, and Shakespeare obviously has done that on purpose. He didn't feel that he needed to show a scene between them and perhaps what he was saying was they're not very close by the fact that there is no scene between them. But Romeo um, is much closer to, to the friar and they have um, a number of scenes where it's just the two of them and they're talking about really deep and important things uh, to Romeo and what he's experiencing. And then finally, the friar has a deep knowledge of herbs and plants and how they affect the body. Um, firstly, this uh, reinforces what an educated man of the time he was, but it also becomes really important for uh, an element of plot later in the play that he knows how to combine herbs and plants to bring about different effects um, in the body if they are if they are drunk uh, as, a, as a concoction as a, as a as a potion okay so all you have to do is write those six points down do not try and listen to me and write everything down i say as well when you've written that down we need to go and have a look at the scene uh, that follows between friar lawrence and romeo Right, um, if you've got your uh, text by the side of you or open, however uh, Mr Stevenson's class are doing this, um, you will notice that the beginning of Act 2, Scene 2 starts with quite a long speech by the, by the friar. I've, um, I've decided we're going to leave that uh, for now. It's quite a long-winded speech and a lot of it is, to be honest with you, rather boring. Uh, there are a few bits that are of interest in how they set the character of the friar up and prepare us for something that he does later in the play. But as with a few other bits, I, I think this will be far better done once we're all back in school and, and myself and Mr. Stevenson are teaching you face to face. Um, so You'll just have to trust me with that, that that is a good decision for me to make. And we're going to get on and read through the rest of this scene. It's not a really long scene, but there, there's a lot of good stuff in it. OK, here we go. Good morrow, father. Oh, Benedicte. What early tongue so sweet saluteth me? Young son, mm, it argues a distempered head so soon to bid good morrow to thy bed. Care keeps his watch in every old man's eye, and where care lodges, sleep will never lie. But where unbruised youth with unstuffed brain doth couch his limbs, there golden sleep doth reign. 
Therefore thy earliness doth me assure thou art uproused by some distemperature, or if not so, then here I hit it right. Our Romeo hath not been in bed tonight. The last is true, and the sweeter rest was mine. Oh, a God pardon sin, wast thou with Rosaline? With Rosaline, my ghostly father, no. Oh, I have forgot that name, and that name's woe. Oh, that's good, that's my good son. But where hast thou been then? I'll tell thee, ere thou asked it me again, I have been feasting with mine enemy, where on a sudden one hath wounded me, that's by me wounded. Both our remedies within thy help and holy physic lies. I bear no hatred, blessed man, for lo, my intercession likewise steads my foe. Be plain, good son, and homely in thy drift. Riddling confession finds but riddling shift. Then plainly know my heart's dear love is set on the fair daughter of rich Capulet. As mine on hers, so hers is set on mine and all combined save what thou must combine by holy marriage when and where and how we met we wooed and made exchange of vow i'll tell thee as we passed but this i pray that thou consent to marry us today holy saint francis what a change is here is rosaline whom thou didst love so dear so soon forsaken oh Young men's love then lies, not truly in their hearts, but in their eyes. Jesus Maria, what a deal of brine hath washed thy sallow cheeks for Rosaline. How much salt water thrown away in waste, to season love that of it doth not taste. <clears throat> the sun not yet thy sighs from heaven clears, thy old groans ring yet in my ancient ears. Lo. Here upon thy cheek the stain doth sit of an old tear that is not washed off yet. If e'er thou wast thyself and these woes thine, thou and these woes were all for Rosaline. And art thou changed? Pronounce this sentence then. Women may fall when there's no strength in men. Thou chidst me oft for loving Rosaline. <clears throat> for doting, not for loving, pupil mine, and bathed me bury love, not in a grave, to lay one in, another out to have. I pray thee, chide not, she whom I love now, doth grace for grace, and love for love allow, the other, did not so. Oh, she knew well, thy love did read by rote and could not spell. But come, young waverer, come, go with me. In one respect, I'll thy assistant be. For this alliance may so happy prove to turn your household's rancour to pure love. Oh, let us hence, I stand on sudden haste. Wisely and slow. They stumble that run fast. OK, um, our job uh, today and tomorrow is to get to grips with um, uh, what happens in this conversation between Romeo and Friar Lawrence. We really need to understand um, what Romeo is saying about how he has changed from his supposed love from Rosaline to his true love from Juliet and the, um, the shock of Friar Lawrence when he comments on the speed of all this happening and then the, um, the advice that he gives and the important decision that he makes 
that he will indeed marry them because he hopes that by joining Romeo and Juliet together, that the two families hate for each other will have to be put to one side and the feud will be brought to a close. Of course, we as an audience and a reader, we know that's not going to happen. But the friar obviously hasn't read the prologue and he doesn't know that. Right, we're going to end the lesson with two screens of annotation into your or onto your um, Romeo and Juliet text. Now, I haven't finished the scene uh, because I am trying to be more aware of the speed that some of you work. So there are just the two screens of this. I've timed my instructions so far and for a 45 minute lesson you should still have 25 minutes left um, so that should be plenty of time to annotate your Romeo and Juli Juliet texts with the idea and understanding um, that I put uh, on this screen and on the next screen okay so when you finish that annotation that is today's lesson and we'll finish annotating the whole scene um, at the start of tomorrow's lesson. But as I say, I'm just trying not to overload you um, so that people don't end up falling behind uh, as they did last half term. OK, well done, folks. When you've finished your annotations, that's it for today. See you tomorrow.